Hello and welcome everyone to the New Look Mashroom Show, the place for landlords to come for help and advice with insurance, tenant finding, mortgages, rent collection, a whole lot more. This is a pre-recorded show, but we will be taking your questions live at the end. So drop them in and we'll get to them very shortly. I'm Rob Smith. And top of the agenda for this edition are the changes around eviction and gaining possession of your property. There were rumours last week that the abolishment of Section 21 would be overturned. The government has since come out and said that it would still be going ahead, but it's not clear yet when that will be happening. So we'll be looking at the process behind both Section 21 and Section 8, what they are, when you should serve them, how you go about serving them, and all the other legal details that you need to be aware of in order to successfully serve these. Landlords have been wondering what might happen with Section 21 for the last three years or so, as the government's insisted that it would be abolishing so-called no-fault evictions, despite rumours to the contrary. So we're going to be having a chat with our main guest today, property litigation solicitor and head of dispute resolution, Adrian McClinton. Adrian, thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. Um, we'll also, during the course of the show, be touching on new selective licensing schemes and the current economic chaos and how all of that may affect your bottom line. Now, don't forget, you can follow Mushroom any number of different ways on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. And of course, you can join our private Facebook community where you can share your experiences, ask questions, and get the support and the answers that you need. We'll also be sending out a recording of this webinar as well as a review request. So we'd really appreciate you taking the time to leave us a review. If our conversation sparks an idea or a question that you want to share, you can do that via the Facebook community page at any time. We've got loads to get stuck into, so without further ado, Let's get started. Section 21, as you know, is the no fault eviction, which you would use if your tenants not in breach of their contract in any way, but you need to gain possession of your property again for whatever reason. Uh, I'm joined by Adrian McClinton, who's property litigation solicitor. And you're also the, uh, the head of dispute resolution at your firm, aren't you? I am, yes. So you've got a broad spread of knowledge on all of this. We can ask you whatever we need to know. I hope so, yes. Excellent, good, right. Well, we look forward to getting through that. So let's start at the, at the beginning with the basics. Mm. Section 21, what is it? Well, Section 21 is the Section 21 notice is a notice served pursuant to Section 21 of the Housing Act 1988. Housing Act 1988 governs all private rented sector tenancies. So, generally speaking, the tenancy that a landlord will have with a tenant. Now, the notice itself, if it's served validly, entitles a landlord to obtain possession of its property if the tenant does not move out at the end of the notice period. Uh, crucially, the notice can be served without the landlord citing any reason. As long as the landlord serves a valid Section 21 notice, it is entitled to possession. And importantly, the court has absolutely no discretion whatsoever as to whether the landlord gets a possession order or not. If the landlord serves a valid notice, it is entitled to possession. Right, okay. So at the moment, that's, the, that's where the law stands yes. at the minute. And when might you want to, to use a Section 21 then? Well, generally speaking, it, because the landlord doesn't have to say anything as to, as to the reason it's serving the notice, it can be used at any time. But the, the notice itself must expire after the fixed term of the tenancy. And it may well be a situation where the uh, landlord wants possession back but doesn't want to have to go to court and have a court hearing in order to obtain possession. So if it's going to go, what's that actually going to mean then in pragmatic terms for landlords? So wh whether you're retiring and you just want to you know, sell up and, and go off and live in the sun somewhere or whether you've got a, a, a problem tenant or not, at the moment Section 21 would be the the go-to way of, of achieving that? Yes, yes, it would be. I think that it's important to look at Section 21 in its context, how it came about, to see how that's going to affect landlords in the future mm -hmm. and how it isn't necessarily the case that uh, we'll be going back to a period where uh, investment in property isn't as um, attractive to uh, landlords as it used to be. So I think 
If you look at Section 21, it was brought in by the Housing Act in uh, the 1980s. Um, I'm taking you back to a time before that. All private rented sector tenancies were uh, governed by the Rent Act 1977. Now, these tenancies and ending these tenancies it was notoriously difficult. Um, rents were lower, they were suppressed by the legislation itself, and also tenants had the right to succession. So essentially a family member could uh, inherit the tenancy as well. Now, the introduction of the Housing Act resulted in uh, essentially providing landlords and investors the one thing that they crave, and that's certainty. They could be certain that at the end of the tenancy, if they served a Section 21 notice, they could be guaranteed possession. So it effectively um, acted as a, a deregulation of the industry, if you like, and resulted as in turbocharging investment in property. And that's one of the reasons behind this, the boom in investment in property and uh, the private rented sector. Okay, so it, the fact that there has been talk for several years around scrapping Section 21, mm. clearly, given the fact that's part of the reason why a lot of people got into the landlording business in the first place, mm. removing that is going to be deeply worrying for a lot of landlords. Yes and no. I don't know if I entirely agree with you because what has changed from prior to the Housing Act 1988 is the private rented sector itself and the landscape surrounding that. So it's no longer the case that private renting is the preserve of the disenfranchised or the working class. The middle class now are facing uh, the need to rent for longer and more often, young professionals for instance. So actually as a result of that and the abolition of Section 21 is a reflection of the momentum that has been gained in, in granting renters more rights. But of course it's not, the same, it's not the same landscape anymore. Middle class, young professionals are renting for longer. It's, it's not the same type of tenant. And I think that will uh, provide landlords some comfort. Okay, and so the, the, the whole it gives you an idea of what the, the reasoning behind scrapping Section mm. 21 would be. Is it to give more comfort and security to tenants? Is that the point of it? I think so. Because the type of people renting are those that, well, they've got sharp elbows. They'll insist on having rights uh, in the sense that the previous type of renter perhaps didn't know how to go about getting. And as a result, there is a momentum behind uh, increase in the rights of renters. Let's assume for the moment that it is now going to go. Mm -hmm. Where does that leave landlords? What should they be thinking about? Well, what it will mean is that landlords will have to provide a reason, a valid reason, as to why they want vacant possession of the property. So Section 21 is going to be abolished, and then the grounds on which a landlord can seek possession of a property will be expanded. So, for instance, There'll now be a ground where if the landlord wants to sell the property, they can serve a notice ending the tenancy, citing that ground. Also, if a landlord wants to move into a property, at the moment a landlord can serve a notice stating it wants to move back into the property and use it as their residential home. However, the group in which uh, can be cited by the landlord as, as who wants to live there has been widened to include close family members. At the moment it's just the landlord. So as somebody who's working within the legal profession mm. and looking at all this kind of stuff, has the, um, the, the fact that this has gone backwards and forwards so much been unhelpful? Is that a way of putting it? You know, the fact that it's put uncertainty into what's going to happen in the future? I think so as well. I mean, as I talked about before, the one thing that the Housing Act 1988 brought with it was certainty. And landlords, like any other investor, wants certainty and it may well be that this government needs to bear that in mind but certainty is absolute key um, and I think that so long as there are grounds and ways in which a landlord can obtain possession of a property it shouldn't concern landlords as much as it as it may do at first blush. Okay so let's let's stick with section 21 as it is now for a yes. minute 
If somebody wants to take possession of their property and evict a, a tenant at some point, what's the kind of the nitty gritty of that? How, how do you actually go through that process? Well, it's certainly got a lot harder over the years due to successive pieces of legislation. But there are two things that a landlord needs to bear in mind before it serves a Section 21 notice. The contractual preconditions, so what it states within the tenancy agreement, and also the overarching legislation that provides uh, protection to tenants and regulates tenancy agreements within the private rented sector. So starting with contractual preconditions, well that should be fairly easy. Look at the tenancy agreement, what does the tenancy agreement state um, the landlord must do in order to serve a Section 21 notice. Thankfully most tenancy agreements are fairly standard in form so it'll be a case of serving notice at the, at the property itself. Um, but a landlord must follow those contractual preconditions. So if it states the landlord must serve a notice on a Tuesday morning before 11 o'clock, then the landlord must do that. That's the first hurdle. The second, and I would say probably more complicated, is the amount of um, preconditions that have been brought in by legislation that prevents a landlord serving a Section 21 notice. These are the things that a landlord must comply with. Um, and it's a very long list. Mm. So for instance... So they would have to get legal advice on knowing what that long list of things is, would they? Um, well, I would say that they should. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's certainly a lot more complicated than it used to be. Before the introduction of, say for instance, the, the Housing Act 2004, which introduced uh, regulations regarding the housing, the deposit that a, a, a tenant uh, pays to a landlord, it was a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Essentially all, they, all the landlord had to do was ensure that they replicated the, the wording, complied with the wording of the Section 21 within the Housing Act 1988. But f for instance now this list is, is quite long, so for instance a Section 21 notice can't be served in the first four months of the tenancy agreement. The landlord needs to have protected the tenancy deposit and served what's known as the prescribed information. The landlord needs to have provided the tenant various uh, documentation relating to the tenancy itself, how to rent leaflets, EPC certificates. Uh, landlord needs to ensure that they've got the right licensing in place before they serve a Section 21 notice returned any money that they've received that is now prohibited under the Tenant Fees Act. And then finally, they need to ensure that if they are going to issue proceedings, they issue proceedings within a certain time limit because it, uh, the Act itself operates a lose it, uh, use it or lose it uh, approach right, to Right, OK. So there is quite a long list of things list. that you have to yeah. go through. You have to get pitfalls you can fall into if you don't Indeed. dot the I's and cross the T's as you're going along. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to, it's a bit of a sidebar in a way, but obviously we're coming out of the effects of the, the pandemic and the lockdown and all that kind mm. of stuff. Is there still a knock-on effect, a hangover from all the delays that have been put into the system from that, or is it starting to work its way out now? Uh, well, it's starting to work its way out, but there are serious backlogs. Um, there is variation across the region. So in more populated areas that the courts serve, the, uh, the delays in the court process, if that's what you're referring to, are huge. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit better in the regions. So for instance, uh, I recently um, acted for a landlord who had a property down in Brighton, uh, served the notice, made the application to court because the tenant didn't leave. And it went quite smoothly. And the hearing, while slightly delayed, it wasn't too delayed. Whereas in London, recently acting for a landlord uh, in relation to some trespasser proceedings. Uh, we obtained the possession order in, uh, at the end of August and we're still actually waiting for the order to be typed up. All right, okay. So it very much depends on mm. where you are as to how Absolutely. long the, de the delays are in the, in the system. So um, section eight, we need to talk about, if we talk about section 21, we need to talk about section eight, don't we? The two kind Absolutely. of go hand in hand and they, they, they complement each other in lots of ways. When would you bring in Section 8 legislation as opposed to going down the Section 21 route? Well, Section 8 sometimes is referred to as a, 
as a, um, a notice that's served by a landlord when the tenant is in breach. And that's a little bit misleading. So section eight is a notice that's served on a, on a tenant when uh, there are certain grounds that are prescribed within the legislation, Schedule two of the Housing Act 1988, that um, if those grounds exist, a landlord can serve a section eight notice on a tenant. What, what kind of grounds would they be? Well, the most common ground is uh, rent arrears, and there are three separate grounds, because the grounds themselves are split into uh, mandatory grounds and discretionary grounds. So where a landlord can prove that a mandatory ground exists, the court has absolutely no discretion as to whether to grant possession. Where it's only a discretionary ground that exists, then the court o only has to grant a possession order where it considers it reasonable to do so. So rent arrears is probably the most common ground. Uh, nuisance and annoyance is another ground that's a discretionary ground. Mm -hmm. Um, breach of tenancy is another ground. So, for instance, a common breach is not providing access to the premises when requested by the landlord. Other mandatory grounds, the landlord wants to move back into the property as its residential home. Uh, but by far the most common is, uh, is rent arrears. And when we, just to be clear on discretionary, is that at the discretion of the landlord or is that at the discretion of the court? You know, because, <laughs> because well, one person's, you know, I'm really fed up with this yeah. tenant, I just want them out. Is that grounds enough, just being fed up with them? No. No. No, this is someone's home. Yeah. And it will be for the court to decide whether, on the facts, they consider it reasonable to grant a possession order. So let's assume that a tenant is in breach of their... Um, their agreement with their landlord and the landlord wants to, to move them out. Um, what's the process then going through with, with, is it better to go down the section 21 or a section eight route? Is there a kind of a preferred mode of going forwards? I think most landlords prefer serving a section 21 notice, mainly because whilst it takes two months to expire, uh, you can go through what's known as the accelerated possession procedure. So that's where the, the court doesn't listen, you don't need a court hearing. The, the judge will go through the paperwork and if you've ticked all the boxes, which there are a lot of nowadays, as I've already been through, um, then you should get a possession order. Uh, what, there's nothing to prevent a landlord from serving both. So a section 21 notice and a section eight notice citing the relevant grounds uh, within that notice. Uh, as I say, more often than not, rent arrears. Uh, if the tenant then clears the rent arrears off, uh, the landlord no longer has those grounds to rely on, but what the landlord can rely on is the Section 21 notice that's been served. Now we've had um, a couple of quite interesting things come up in the, uh, the our, our Facebook community mm -hmm. group with people talking about their, their personal um, situations. One of which involved um, somebody talking about the fact that they had a member of their own family who they had been renting a property out to for a number of years but they have now not paid rent for several months um, and that obviously has an added wrinkle of complication because there's a, a family connection mm -hmm. there. What in, in general terms advice would you give to people when they have that kind of a scenario crops up? Well family and business is a bad thing, I think. Um, well, so long as there is uh, a legally binding contractual relationship between the two parties, regardless of whether it's brother and sister or a family member, um, the, uh, the landlord should more often than not follow the, the, the well-trodden path of serving the correct notice and seeking possession. Now, it could make uh, Christmas gatherings quite interesting in this particular instance, but ultimately, if the tenant won't leave, the only way the tenancy agreement can be brought to an end is by serving a notice and obtaining a possession order. And we were talking about Section 8 and the fact that you have to jump through a number of, of hoops to make it happen if you do want to, to move them out. What are the kind of um, clear and obvious pitfalls, if you like, that people need to make sure that they they don't fall into when you're going to serve a Section 8 notice? Well, again, as I, as I said uh, at the, in relation to Section 21 notices, it's really important that the landlord 
considers the content of the tenancy agreement and what it states in relation to service of notices under Section 8. The tenancy agreement must state the grounds on which a landlord is entitled to rely on. And you'll see in some tenancy agreements that some grounds are missing. Um, but as I say, in, as with, in relation to Section 21 and uh, the provisions relating to notice, notice and service of notice, generally speaking, they'll be pretty standard. So it's important that the landlord follows uh, the, what the tenancy agreement states. But I think given the amount of hurdles that a landlord needs to uh, overcome when serving a Section 21 notice, I would actually say that serving a Section 8 notice is, is easier. Uh, it's just that you have uh, the complication of actually, if the tenant doesn't leave at the end of the notice and you issue proceedings, you will have a hearing at which you need to prove the ground on which you're seeking to rely on. All right, okay. So let's get you to put your, your other hat on for a moment, dispute resolution, um, because clearly in general terms, if you can overcome an issue between landlord and tenant and not have to go down the eviction notice serving route at all, but actually get everybody back on side again, that's probably preferable. It's probably cheaper in the long run, isn't it? I think so. Um, and also landlords, ultimately most landlords own a property for investment purposes. And so therefore they're looking for a return on their investment. And what they, what they want to avoid is void periods. So if you remove a tenant from uh, a property, you will inevitably um, experience a vo void period. So um, where it is possible to reach agreement and move forward, I would always recommend that. However, what landlords do need to understand is that sometimes um, it's really important to not throw good money after bad. If, for instance, a tenant isn't paying rent, it's probably because they don't have the money. And if that's the case, the landlord does need to act quickly in order to protect its investment. So what are, well, I think we're, we're, I was going to say, what are the most common things that landlords are going to find themselves in dispute over? And fundamentally, rent arrears is the number one. Absolutely. Yep, rent arrears, it really is. Um, when I'm acting for landlords and uh, there is the opportunity, let's say, for instance, there isn't rent arrears and it's some other breach. If I'm acting for landlords uh, and there isn't any, um, the asset itself isn't in danger, isn't at risk, so they're not, the tenant isn't causing damage to the property. If I'm act, act, acting for a landlord and there is the opportunity to serve a Section 21 notice uh, and progressed on that route instead of serving a Section 8 notice and trying to prove that the tenant has, for instance, caused nuisance and annoyance to neighbours, that's going to involve a hearing. Mm -hmm. it's, going to, it's going to be prolonged proceedings. A tenant may deny that, so therefore you may even have a defended claim. Whereas if you go down the Section 21 route, if you serve the valid Section 21 notice, as long as you've complied with all the, the preconditions, then you should be entitled to a possession order. And it's not guaranteed if you go down the Section 8 route. No, right, okay. So it, 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 sticking with the conflict resolution bit for a moment then, what would your key bit of advice to landlords be in trying to sort of de-escalate de these kind of issues in the first place? Well, uh, communication is key. Uh, with the tenant, to get in touch with the tenant, find out if there is rent arrears, for instance, find out if there is a problem, why there is a problem. may well be that there's just been a, a lapse in the direct debit or something, but I think it's really important for a landlord to make early contact with the tenant where there is, uh, where there is a breach of tenancy, uh, a breakdown in the relationship. Um, where, for instance, there is nuisance and annoyance, uh, I, I know of landlords that um, what they do in advance of putting tenants into uh, a new property is they visit the neighbours and they explain that they're going to be renting the property out. They ensure that the neighbours within close proximity have the landlord's contact details. And that can help de-escalate things because if the landlord is contacted about the nuisance and annoyance, they can, they can contact the tenant and uh, ask them to behave themselves. So there are various measures that landlords can take to try and ensure that conflict is avoided in the first place. But I say I would say that communication is absolutely key. Keep talking, always right. keep talking. Yeah. And as a kind of a, a final 
up some then, if you will. Um, we're still waiting to actually hear a, a, a date for when Section 21 mm. might be repealed. Are you comfortable with where we're at in terms of the advice that's being given out to the legal profession? Do you know when things are going to happen or are you as much in the dark as everybody else at the moment? Well, we had the announcement last week that it wasn't going to be abolished, which is good. I mean, uh, successive governments have been talking about abolishing Section 21 for a long time now. Um, and I think the sector has got used to the idea of it being abolished and the additional grounds that are going to be added to enable the landlord to obtain possession. Um, when it's actually going to happen, I don't know. Uh, I don't think anyone knows yet. Um, but I think that what is absolutely important and key to um, the success of this legislation is ensuring that there is enough investment in uh, the court service to ensure that where there are breaches of tenancy or where a ground exists where a landlord wants to obtain possession, that uh, the, the process itself doesn't take as long as it takes at the moment to obtain possession. Oh, that's okay. We'll we'll try and make them hear that message. Then <laughs> we'll do do our best on that score. And as a, as a final thought for for landlords, it's that thing you were saying: communication. Keep talking as as long as possible. Yes. Now, one of the things that we mentioned in the last edition of the Mushroom Show was rent guarantee insurance, which of course can be incredibly reassuring to have. Uh, because it means that no matter what, if you do fall into dispute with your tenant, uh, if they can't pay their rent for whatever reason, you can rest assured that your rent will keep coming in. So just so you know, Mashroom's rent guarantee insurance is £299 a year per property, and that covers you up to £2,500 per month in missed rent and also offers legal advice and financial support if you need to evict. If you'd like to know more, then you can get in touch with George Sinclair here at Mashroom, and he is george.sinclair at mashroom.com. Nice and simple. So before we let you go, Adrian, what's your kind of final key thought, if you like, for landlords? I think landlords need to understand that being a landlord is more complicated than ever. And as a result of that, it's really important that they keep abreast of changes in legislation and their obligations towards their tenants, because a failure to do so could be hugely detrimental to their investment and the management of their property. OK, so for people who are watching this, this is a really useful conversation that we've had then. Oh, absolutely. Good. I'm glad about that. Adrian, thank you very much for being with us. Well, I'm joined now by Robin Wilson, who's uh, one of our brilliant video makers here at uh, Mashroom. And we're going to find out a little bit more about uh, what she does, what we all do here, what we've got coming up in the Mashroom community as well. Robin, thanks ever so much for being thanks with us. Me. So uh, first of all, who are you? What do you actually do? So I'm a video content creator here at Mashroom. Um, so I'm very involved in the Facebook community, looking at what landlords are talking about, what topics are popular and what people have questions about and then I'll turn that into a video for people to just watch. So you mentioned the community group there um, I mean it's quite a big deal isn't it it's a really yeah, important it's pretty thing. Good. Yeah. Um, I mean it's a, it's a private Facebook community so landlords can go there to share their stories or ask for advice and not only are Mushroom there answering questions but actually you've got about 3,000 other landlords experienced landlords um, so you can actually kind of banter backwards and forwards with people <laughs> exactly, within it yeah. and get advice from people directly who've been through things themselves. Yeah, yeah. and the community is just growing, so it's All great. Yeah, it's a really, well, it's a really good it's space. It's a useful thing. Now you, as we said, you're a video maker. So what does that mean? What are you actually, put, how are you producing these videos? Um, so like I say, on the community, just looking at what people want to see, but also making something that's slightly easier to digest and get your head around. Um, when you're reading a really long blog post or perhaps if you go on our website there's a lot of writing and it's all so informative but sometimes people just want to click play and sit there with a cup of tea and well, watch this it. Is the thing, because if you're talking about I don't know uh, rent guarantee insurance yeah. or you're talking about buildings insurance mm. or you're talking about legal advice it, it's got the potential to be quite dry hasn't yeah, it? So, so this is <laughs> so th this is a way of actually making it a bit more interesting. Yeah, a bit more, a bit more engaging and just something that you can 
enjoy watching um, but you know getting all the information you need to know because I have to confess I have seen you doing a little groovy dance in the corner <laughs> with the phone for yes, presumably like, TikTok maybe purposes guilty. Mm -hmm. yes every now and then you do have to make the sacrifice of doing a TikTok dance but you know it just makes it a bit more fun for people to watch am I getting roped into that at some point you never do you want to you kind of sound like you want to oh is that what it sounds like right okay <laughs> I might Landlord, have to back speak on that now one. If, you, if you want to see Rob doing a TikTok dance so um what you're actually going to end up then over a period of time is with kind of a big uh chunk of all these different topics broken down yeah kind exactly of like a toolkit that you yeah. can refer to so we're working our way through the website to get through every single page so for example, if you're looking at buildings insurance and you want to know why a whole of market broker like Mashroom might be better, um, then there's going to be a video on that. And anything you need to know about our products, services, or just as a landlord in general, there's going to be a video. Brilliant. Robin, thank you very much. Uh, Robin Wilson is our video person who we've just been hearing. You can find out all about the uh, Mushroom community on Facebook. You should definitely join it. As Robin says, it's a, a close-knit community full of great advice and support. Keep an eye out for all those videos too. <laughs> <laughs>Well, you join me now in the Mashroom newsroom. And uh, of course, we're gonna be talking about the latest economic situation very shortly. But before we do, here's something that landlords in Leicester in particular need to be aware of. As of Monday, 10th of October, Leicester have launched its selective licensing extension in three areas of the city, which means they're gonna be charging landlords 1,090 pounds per property, the highest fee in the Midlands. The scheme affects nearly 9,000 properties in Saffron Ward, Stonygate, parts of Bournston Park, Westcoats, Foss and Rowley Fields. As of Monday 10th of October, you have 18 months to apply for a licence before the council will issue you with a £200 penalty fee. However, as of Tuesday the 11th of October, your tenant could pursue you for rent repayment orders. Now, the council has said that they won't pursue landlords during that time, but if you are based in Leicester, contact your council and get it sorted. This only affects Leicester, but as a landlord, in general terms, you are responsible for ensuring that you have everything in place. Not knowing is, unfortunately, not an excuse. So we recommend that you contact your council every six to 12 months, just to make sure that there are no new rules that have come in that you might have missed. After all, it's always better to be safe than sorry. So now let's look at the ongoing economic turmoil. Well, UK GDP is estimated to have fallen by 0.3% in August 2022. Inflation currently sits at an estimated 12% in October due to food, fuel and wage-driven inflation. It's estimated that that could have even gone over 16% had the Bank of England not stepped in to try and stabilise the financial markets following the mini-budget. Inflation is expected to remain at well over 10% well into 2023. The Bank of England base rate is currently at 2.25%. It's expected it could rise as high as 5.5% by next July. Now, the average UK house price in July of 2021 was £253,000. The average UK house price in July 22, £292,000. That's a £39,000 increase. Consumers are, of course, getting hit in the pocket from every direction. Food, fuel, energy. So where does all of this leave people who are looking to actually try and purchase a property? Well, of course, you'll need a much larger deposit if you're going to buy a house now, as well, of course, as a lar larger mortgage. It doesn't just affect first-time buyers, of course. It affects landlords too. If you had been budgeting to invest in another property, then these jumps will have affected your plans, and that's before you consider how they will affect your mortgage. So with that in mind, let's have a conversation with our mortgage expert here at Mashroom, Robert Winfield, so we can find out more about how it might affect your plans to expand your portfolio. Rob, good to have you with us once again. I mean, it's been a very turbulent few weeks, isn't it? Let's just quickly sum up then where we're actually at at the moment. 
Yes, well, nice yes. to speak nice. again. Thanks for having us. Um, yeah, it, I mean, we're in a very similar situation to where we were last time. Um, rates are still maintaining at a what we deem fairly high level. Um, inflation, I think, is still at a very similar uh, level. And we're obviously, there's quite a lot, like you've said, turmoil in, um, in Parliament at the moment. So, yeah, very similar situation to last time we caught up. But uh, we were also talking about the fact that huge numbers of mortgage products had been taken off the market. Something like 1,600 had disappeared um, over the course of the previous couple of weeks. Has that rate yeah. of change slowed down? Are things starting to settle down a little bit more at the moment? Yes. As one positive, we have seen a lot of the lenders coming back to market with their new product ranges. So we've seen a lot of them reintroduced. There's still a few that are remaining tentative to the situation that are still with, withholding their products. They haven't all come back to market and reintroduced, specifically on that buy-to-let market piece. Obviously, we are um, landlord heavy anyway, so that's a lot of our customer base. Uh, but yeah, it is a step in the right direction, but we're still not back up to full capacity. OK, so let's look at landlords specifically and remortgaging. If, you, if you're in the situation where you've got to remortgage within the next three to six months, what would your advice be? Good question. Um, it's best to sit down and speak with us, speak with the broker, speak with myself. We've got a great team here. Um, we've all got some life experience under our belts. So we'd like to think that we're going to be best placed to point you in the right direction in terms of the actual different options you've got there's a few variables there's approaching your pre-existing lender there's remortgaging out to another lender um, it once again it, it's difficult to give you a, um, a generic answer we'd always say we'd like to give you the best answer but that does mean having a, a brief conversation with us first always talk one-to-one -one. So, so yeah when you talk about um, actually buying a new property for instance if somebody's looking to get into the market or they're looking to expand their portfolio uh, what's the situation at the moment? The last year has seen quite a big rise in house prices, but it's perhaps not quite so certain which direction the market's going in right now this minute. Yeah, exactly. I think to, to be transparent, um, the, the, the whole buy-to-let market model works. It's worked for a long time. It's worked for a lot of years and landlords have been expanding portfolios for a long period of time. This most recent interest rate increase has definitely seen a slight stall in the market, um, mainly because those profit margins are just being hit even more now. Um, like you've said, increased property prices, that's always been fine, but the increased interest rates has really has a detrimental effect on borrowing. And that's obviously massive in terms of profit margins for landlords. So I'll, I'll be transparent. We've had a few conversations with landlords over the last few weeks um, where it hasn't actually been anywhere near as feasible for them to expand their portfolio right here and now. Whereas six months ago, that was a no brainer. Walk in the park. Um, it's a fairly easy model once we drill down on it, whereas now it's it is a little bit um, more difficult and it really has to be the right property for landlords to actually consider um, purchasing and, and expanding the portfolio. So it's all still doable, but you do need to it do is, properly yeah. think about it. Yeah, you really need to look at each individual um, property on its own merit. Uh, and a lot of properties have been ruled out simply because borrowing's just, it's not cost effective. And obviously everyone is in the market to make money off their properties. So um, yeah, the, there are other ways I think that they can um, limit it and interest rate increases isn't necessarily the the right course of action in my opinion anyway okay rob thank you very much for being with us once again i'm sure we're going to talk about this <laughs> more as we yeah. go forward over the, the next few weeks and months thanks very much rob winfield our yeah. mortgage expert there Well, that's it for The Mashroom Show this week. Thank you to our expert guests, Adrian McClinton and Robert Winfield for their brilliant insight. Just a reminder, we will be going to a live Q&A now. So if you have any questions, please stick around for that. Be sure to check out our website next week. We'll be continuing to talk about lots of the points that you've raised here. We'll be back for the next Mushroom Show in two weeks time. Keep an eye out for our upcoming tax series. We will be doing a deep dive on how the latest tax changes could affect landlords, allowable expenses, income tax, all of that. Also, please don't forget to join the community. We'll see you in a couple of weeks time. Take care.